Sabbath. Happy Sabbath to everyone. I hope you guys have good two Sabbaths without my presence. I know that some of you are much more happy that I left. So two Sabbaths. Uh, we had Southwestern uh, Adventist University here last Sabbath, and we also had Rachel Black speaking. Um, so I'm glad to be back. I'm glad to continue on the series of Luke. Uh, this month, we also have Pastor Antonio Cano coming next week. And then we have Sandra Patterson giving a report of her mission trip in Kenya uh, that she took last month. So, so a lot of interesting things uh, happening here in our church uh, for the coming weeks. But today we continue, uh, Luke. And obviously, we're going to have a, a recap on the things that we've been learning. So at this moment, I'd like to invite you to open up your Bibles in Luke chapter 13. Starting in verse 18. Okay? And when you have found it, you can say, Giselle O'Daniel. Giselle O'Daniel, she's sitting right there in the back. And you should come to church, and especially fellowship meal, on the days that that lady is cooking. Because her food is simply one of the best best food out there. So, so Giselle O'Daniel, just wave, Giselle. People need to know who you are. Yes, yes. So Giselle right there, a blessing because she, there are people who feed you the spiritual food, but she is the pro in feeding you the physical food. And we're thankful for that gift. Let's have a quick word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for all you do for us and the privilege of being here this morning. Open our hearts and our minds to what you have to teach us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. For those that were here about three weeks ago, uh, we talked about the woman who was bent over. She was healed on the Sabbath. Many people were unhappy, especially the leader of the synagogue, right? Unhappy with Jesus for doing healings on the Sabbath at the synagogue. And one of the key lessons that we learned uh, last week time that I was speaking on was that religion without Jesus leads to inhumanity. Religion without the fruits of the Spirit leads to insensitivity. Religion without kingdom living leads to legalism and oppression. So that was an important lesson for all of us to learn and the fact that Jesus is able to lose whatever thing is binding us, right? Whatever slavery we feel that we can't get out of. So we're coming from that perspective. Before we open now here, chapter 13, verse 18, Jesus is coming from that healing story. And it reads like this. Then he said, what is the kingdom of God like? And to what shall I compare it? It is like a mustard seed, which a man took and put in his garden, and it grew and became a large tree. And the birds of the air nested in its branches. And he gives a second example. And again he said, to what shall I liken the kingdom of God? It is like leaven which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal. It was all leavened. Jesus starts off in a connection with this story. Many people point that Jesus is speaking these words as a connection to the story of the healing. As if this small demonstration of power, the healing of this woman, despite being a small act through the eyes of many, it can have big results, right? It can have a huge impact. Just like a tiny mustard seed can grow up into a tree, a little bit of leaven can make it something grow as well. The kingdom of God is like that. We underestimate sometimes what a word of kindness, what forgiveness, what Patience can do in the lives of those that are around us. And when I was reading this, it made me think about something very true. If you think about all the people that have impacted you so that you can be here today, so that you can have the faith that you have today, for the, so that you can have that rootedness in the kingdom living today, if you look at the actions, it seems like small actions, right? People around you are having that kind of kingdom living, and it seemed very small. But what Jesus tried to portray here is that do not be discouraged by the small actions that you take. Because those small actions can lead into big results. And I think my friend Christian here knows that very well, right? We have missed you. We haven't seen him for a while. He started coming back to our church here. And small actions, right? If you look and be real about it, it's small actions. And now he's going to Southwestern, right? To, to study theology. 
So it, it, it's, it's a blessing when you go back and you start seeing how the small deeds that we do, they have a direct impact in the lives of people, even though that we don't see it, and even though it's progressive, even though sometimes it takes time. Jesus does not want you to be discouraged when it takes too long for you to see the fruits. So it's a beautiful way to start off, right? Then Jesus dives in to the main part of what we're going to study today, talking about, let me just read the text, verse 22. And he went through the cities and villages, teaching and journeying toward where? Jerusalem. I believe since chapter 9, we've been talking about that Jesus is headed towards Jerusalem. That's where he's going to be judged and killed, and that's where he knows that he has to be. Verse 23, then one said to him, Lord, are there few who are saved? Have you ever asked that question in your Christian journey? Only few are going to be saved? I don't know, it could, could be like a curiosity question. But it, it makes me think sometimes that there are moments that we are more concerned about how many people are going to be saved than actually living the kingdom. Does that make sense? We can spend hours and hours and hours researching. Is the 144,000 a number, you know? Is it a symbol? How many are going to be saved? And we forget to actually live out the kingdom of God, right? But Jesus is patient, and, and he answers this question, not addressing directly that question. Because the, the person that asked the question, he's, he's thinking about quantity. He's thinking about numbers. Jesus' answer is very different from the expectation of the text. Jesus answered in verse 24 by saying, Strive to enter, enter through the narrow gate. For many, I say to you, will seek to enter and will not be able. Now, right now, I just want you to turn to the person next to you, 30 seconds to a minute, and share what is this narrow gate and why is it narrow? Okay? Turn to the person next to you and try to answer those questions. What is the narrow gate and why is it narrow? Go ahead. to enter through the narrow gate for many I say to you will seek to enter and will not be able now the gospel of Matthew adds a few other things it says in Matthew chapter 7 verse 13 enter by the narrow gate for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction so he points two gates and that's kind of something that you see a lot in scripture the way of life and the way of death, the narrow gate, the wide gate. But Matthew also adds, there are many who go through this wide gate, but narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life. And there are few who find it. Now this word for difficult, right? Because you think about the narrow gate. It's difficult to enter it. And what's interesting is that the word for difficult has to do with affliction and oppression. It kind of ties to what Jesus has been talking about in previous verses, about the fact that when you make a decision to live out the principles of the kingdom, an inevitable consequence will be persecution and rejection, right? Because when you offer kindness to those who don't want it, they're going to bite you back. If you seek to love those who hate you, there will be consequences to that as well. So the, the narrow gate entering through to that and also the narrow way is associated with somewhat of a rejection and oppression and things related to that. But it also mentions about few entering it. And this is what got me 
confused a little bit as I was reading this because Jesus in Luke does not address quantity. But all of a sudden you see Matthew addressing, apparently, quantity. But the fewness of the people who find it has nothing to do with quantity itself. It has to do that about the, the few that find it is because they are the ones who are willing to make those changes and sacrifices in the sense of looking at the principles of, of, of king, the kingdom of God, looking at what Jesus has done for their life, and as a response, they seek to offer that same grace and mercy to others. It's easier to want to live within our selfish desires, our good works, either outside of church or inside of church. It happens both places. So Jesus is talking about this, and it says, again, strive to enter through the narrow gate, for many, I say, will seek to enter and will not be able. And he continues, when once the master of the house has risen up and shut the door, and you begin to stand outside and knocking on the door saying, Lord, Lord, open for us. And he will answer and say to you, I do not know you where you are from. So there is an element in the Gospel of Luke that is kind of like an addition to what Matthew does not say. Not only there is a narrow gate, not only there is a wide gate, but also the gate that leads to life has a time. There's a time frame where it will be open. Now, if you just look at the context of everything that we have been talking about, we come to realize, especially in the story of the rich fool, that the door was closed for him when? He was living a selfish life, but there was a moment that he was faced with death. And after that, the door was closed for him. So one thing that we need to keep in mind is that this whole idea, this imminent closing of the gate has to do with the fact that we don't know what it's going to be like tomorrow. We, we have no clue if we're going to be alive. We have no clue if we're going to be dead. And because we don't know the future, our decision must be today. If we want to walk in the narrow gate or through that wide gate. So Jesus is talking about people that thought that they were inside or they had earned their way to be inside, but they were going to find themselves outside. Verse 26 says, Then you will begin to say, We ate and drank in your presence, and you taught in our streets. But he will say, I tell you, I do not know you. Where you are from, depart from me. All you, and this is a heavy word, right? Workers of iniquity. Matthew adds more things that I think the, the Matthew version is more famous because it talks about people coming to Jesus and said, we, we cast out demons in your name, we prophesize. And Jesus says, I do not, I do not know you. Verse 28, there will be, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth when you see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God and you yourselves thrust out. They will come from the east, the west, from the north and the south, which has this idea of people from all over, beyond the boundaries of Israel. We cannot limit salvation to a group of people. We cannot limit salvation to a denomination. We cannot limit salvation to an ethnicity. The Bible is describing people from coming from all over the place, being part of the kingdom, because it goes beyond the boundaries that sometimes we are foolish enough to establish ourselves. They will come from the east and the west, from the north and the south, and sit down in the kingdom of God, and indeed, they're at last who will be first, and there are first who will be who will be last. So if you go back to the, the question that triggered all of this, right? Are there few who are going to be saved? The version of Luke focuses on the fact that, hey, there's a narrow and a wide gate. You have to make a choice. Numbers don't matter. What matters is your decision, right? Don't be caught up in quantities. Be caught up in your desire to serve God and serve Jesus. 
So as I was reading this story, beyond, besides the first lesson that we already learned when it comes to uh, the mustard seed and the leaven, right? The first thing that came to my mind is that we see in this story people coming, being familiar with Jesus. And Jesus says, I do not know you. People that come showing some deeds that they have accomplished, and Jesus says, I do not, I do not know you. And that is very interesting. And a lesson that we can learn just from this part of the story is that to be part of the kingdom of God has nothing to do with familiarity with God. It has to do with the willingness to submit yourselves to the teachings of the kingdom. It has to do with the willingness to accept the free offer of grace that God offers us every single day. See, isn't it, hard, isn't it easy to hide behind familiarity? Many people in the times of Jesus were living in familiarity with God, but not actually living and being in extensions of God in the earth that, that they were called to be. Familiarity is not the same as submission. And sometimes we can get those two things mixed up, right? I'm familiar with lots of things about Jesus, but my heart has not been changed. That's very possible. In the same way that the kingdom of God has nothing to do, is not reserved to those who are focusing on performance. The kingdom of God is those who have genuine fruits that show that they have truly been born again and saved by God. So instead of hiding behind familiarity, instead of hiding behind performance, God asks us to show genuine fruits and accept this free offer of grace and mercy. So that's the first thing that comes to our mind. In that moment, those who are going to be outside, they thought they were inside because they were holding on to their performance and they were holding on to their familiarity with Jesus, but not no change of heart, no change of heart. The second thing that as we're navigating these waters, it has to do with answering the question about the narrow gate. That's why I put up uh, the, the scripture reading this, this morning of chapter, uh, I believe, 9 or 10 of John, right? Where Jesus says, I am the, I am the door. The narrow gate is Jesus. The narrow gate is the gospel. The narrow gate is kingdom living. So if that is one side of the story, the wide gate is everything that is against Jesus, kingdom living, and living in the fruits of the Spirit. Are you guys following? Because what ends up happening, and bear with me on this point, is that we talk about Jesus to others. We teach others about the gospel. But what happens is, is that when we offer them the narrow gate, as soon as they enter the narrow gate, we offer them now other gates that they need to enter, right? It's like the narrow gate is not enough. Jesus is not enough. Kingdom living is not enough. You need to think like us. You need to eat like us. You need to behave like us. And we have 10 other doors that you need to go through so that you can be accepted and not be outside. Are you guys following? Jesus is the door. He is the gate. Gospel living is the gate. When we accept his offer of salvation and grace, we are submitting ourselves to Jesus. So it has nothing to do, the narrowness is not focusing on difficulty. The narrowness has to do with us adapting to that space, adapting to that criteria, which is Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. Try to enter the narrow gate, bringing your good works. You're not going to be able to pass by. It's not going to fit. It goes back to the story of the new wineskins, right? When you try to put the new wine into the old wineskins, it's going to burst. Just like if you try to bring your good works, your accomplishments, your selfishness, and you try to enter into the narrow gate, you're not going to be able to go by. You have to leave all those things behind for you to be able to enter through that narrow gate. 
So as individuals, we must understand the simplicity of the gospel. That is, that Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone is the door. Do not fall into the temptation of thinking there are several other doors beyond that. And not only that, but making others in your circle of influence thinking that there are many other doors that I need to go through before I can have peace of mind that I'm accepted by God. If Jesus Christ is the door, if gospel living is the door, if living in the fruits of the Spirit is the door, that means that the wide door has to do with all of our selfishness. It has to do with all of our temptations and trying to gain and, and, and fight earning, right? Through the things that we do. And that happens outside because we think, hey, you know who is going through the wide gate? It's all of those who are these pagans outside of the church, right? But in the same way that people are focusing on their own accomplishments in their own self and outside of the church, we have many other individuals that are facing the same difficulties of selfishness and trying to earn God's favor inside the church as well. So being in this wide gate where many go has to do with an unchanged heart. And that's why few find it, Sharon. Few find the narrow gate because few are willing to let go of what holds them back. The narrow gate is forgiveness. The narrow gate is kindness. The narrow gate is love. The narrow gate is patience. The narrow gate is sacrifice of self. While the wide gate is all the opposite things. It's indifference. The wide gate is a short temper, right? The wide gate is all the things that clog our hearts from being the true representatives of Jesus Christ in this earth. If you have been tempted to walk through the, 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 the wide gate, know one simple thing, that there is hope for all of us. Sometimes these, this journey that we're in, every single day is a decision of walking through the narrow gate and the wide gate. Some days we choose to walk within the wide gate, and some other days we choose to walk within the narrow gate. But we need to make a decision every single day, and hopefully choose more often the narrow gate. Because that's when we're going to find peace, that's when we're going to find true joy. Because the choosing of the narrow gate is something that not only affects our own individual lives, but it affects the lives of those who are around us because we have become an extension of Jesus Christ to other people. So recap, familiarity has nothing to do with kingdom living, right? Performance has nothing to do with kingdom living. It's about willingness to have a changed heart. It's willingness to have genuine fruit. And the narrow gate is Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ alone, don't try to open or make sure that people have to go through other gates besides the one that is about Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. Am I making sense to all of you here? Amen. Is this something that we can accept in our hearts? It affects your life. It affects your family. It affects your workplace. Because we need to be known by God's mercy and not be known by our restrictions. The narrow gate is kind of wide for those who understand, right? It looks narrow to those who are unwilling. It looks narrow to those who are trying to bring things that will not fit. But have a changed heart. Look to Jesus and Jesus alone, and he will change your life. This is my prayer for all of you this morning. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for all you do for us. Lord, we have a choice to make on a daily basis. Help us put selfishness aside. Help us put accomplishments aside and rely solely on your salvific grace, knowing that, accepting that salvific grace, Lord, that, that inevitably leads to a changed life. 
as we are extensions of Jesus Christ in this earth. Help us put this into practice, Lord, because one thing is to learn, the other is to actually live it out. We are tempted to focus on the things that we can do. We are focused on the things that make us feel earners and deservers. But Lord, help us be reminded every single day that as we look to the narrow door, all of these things will not fit. We need to let go of them, Lord, before we can actually enter into this narrow door, which is Jesus Christ. Help us be a blessing. Help us show Jesus' grace to others instead of focusing on restrictions, Lord, and putting more burdens on those who are already heavy laden. May we make a difference, Lord, as a church and as individuals, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. May God bless you. You're invited to join us for lunch.